scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew 6, 24, and then 31 through 33. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but, you, but your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Adrian. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be in verses 24 through 31 as we continue into week number 4 of our current sermon series that I have entitled Fruitful, uh, Developing the Marks of True Discipleship. We've uh, talked about how Jesus is very clear in various places throughout the Bible, laying out his expectations for those who would call themselves his followers and uh, the different behavioral and lifestyle uh, markers that, uh, that he is looking for evidence of in our lives. And so uh, you can see we're kind of moving down a list here. We've uh, gone through grace, we've gone through repentance that we talked about at length, and then last week we talked about uh, the fruit of suffering well. It's nobody's favorite mark of discipleship, but it's a very important one because it does uh, very important things in our lives. We learned that there are actually blessings that come out of pain. Nobody wishes for pain, nobody invites pain into their life intentionally, and yet God uses it for specific purposes. So last week we saw that uh, the number one thing is that it strips away our masks. It forces us to be real with other people and to be real with ourselves, and that opens us up to genuineness. Our genuineness is revealed to other people, and then in the midst of that, as we change, as we grow, as we are sanctified, uh, God makes room in our lives for hope. And so this week we want to talk about the fruit of righteousness. And righteousness is one of those concepts that's difficult for our, us to grasp. When Jesus talks about being righteous, uh, we have to understand what the context of it is. And so I thought uh, one of the best ways to kind of illustrate this point would be to, uh, to talk about a little bit of a game that we often play, uh, a get-to-know-you kind of exercise. Sometimes it's a group exercise uh, that we do in classes or at seminars and things like that. And it's called the lifeboat game. And, and here's how it works, is uh, you have a scenario that you're supposed to imagine where you're on a cruise ship and the ship is sinking. You're out in the middle of the ocean and the lifeboats are available. The problem is they didn't plan well and there aren't sufficient lifeboats. And so in your scenario, you have 12 people who need into a lifeboat, but there's only room for four. And so as a group, you have to choose from this list uh, which four get to go into the lifeboat and which eight are left to fend for themselves and most likely die in the middle of the ocean. So we have a mother and her child, we have the ship's first mate, we have a 16-year-old boy, an 86-year-old woman, a reality show winner, a nurse, an 80-year-old disaster survivor, a high school teacher, a foreigner, a prostitute, and the head of a drug cartel. And so we would ask the people to put their heads together and say, okay, which four get to live, which eight get to die? And once they choose, then you ask them to process why. Why did you choose those people? Well, what does that have to do with righteousness? You can see there in the text box why I've used this. is because righteousness is essentially just an expression of what we value. Our lifestyles reflect. This is what's most important to me. Just like when we choose the four people who get to be in the lifeboat, it says a lot about what's important to me and what things I don't like and what things I think should, there should be more of in the world. So, our concept of righteousness is an expression of what we value, of what is important, and how we are allowed to go about accomplishing what we value. Uh, this particular passage is written in a historical and cultural context that I want to make sure you understand. Jesus is speaking to people who are living in Galilee. You can see uh, the Sea of Galilee here, and this is where most of Jesus' ministry took place, around the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, this was not a glamorous place to live. Uh, you can see uh, the Galilee region there uh, has a lot of very small towns, and these were inhabited primarily by people who made a subsistence living off of fishing. Historian Alicia Batten says this, fishing 
was the fundamental part of the economy in Galilee. There was no free market and little, if any, upward mobility. Most fishing families lived at subsistence level while a small minority of elites held the bulk of wealth and power. So we have, uh, on one hand, these people that Jesus is living among and he's ministering to who are living these lives of hardship and poverty and uncertainty. And then in contrast, we have in the red there uh, that place that star called Tiberius. And Tiberius was this fantastic resort area. I mean, think about uh, the best, the most lavish resort that you can think of and uh, take that times about 10. And that's plopped right down there on the Sea of Galilee. So Tiberius was this place with ornate vacation homes. Uh, it's a place where people could go to the spa. They could have all of these foods uh, given to them. And they're right there on the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus is teaching and he's speaking to these people who are scratching out a living day by day. They're wondering, am I going to have enough to feed my family? If I go out for the night and I come back with no fish, everybody in my family is going to be hungry. Everybody's going to be disappointed in me. And then they could look up the coast of the Sea of Galilee and they could see the wealthy and the elite of uh, the culture frolicking on the beach in Tiberias and eating until uh, they're full and living in luxury and not worrying at all about uh, how their lives would be. And so it sets up this cultural contrast that we want to understand because the people that Jesus is speaking to understand righteousness as uh, being a reflection of one who has the money to pay for temple sacrifices because under the Jewish law, you had to go to the temple at various times throughout the year and you had to offer a blood sacrifice. You would have to buy a goat or a ram or a bull or a sheep uh, to uh, offer as a sacrifice. And that was supposed to cover all of your sins for the year. And then very poor people, if you remember, when Mary and Joseph go to the temple when Jesus is little, they don't have money for that. They have to buy a sparrow. And so the really poor people could just buy this tiny little bird. And the idea was, you know, if you buy a big goat or a big calf, that covers a lot of sins. But if you just do the little bird, maybe things are kind of iffy for you. And if you are not able to pay for temple sacrifices at all, then the sins of that year remain on your head. So righteousness is somebody who has enough money to pay for those temple sacrifices, whereas a sinner is one who is too poor to pay for sacrifices. And so the message Jesus is speaking is not to the rich, it's not to the people who are self-satisfied primarily, it's to the people who are looking around going, are we going to eat or are we going to offer a temple sacrifice? I guess I'm not righteous. I guess God doesn't care about me because I don't have enough to take care of these needs. Jesus is speaking to these people and he's asking them, reorient your priorities. <coughs> I know it looks grim. I know it looks hopeless. I know it feels like God has abandoned you. But take heart. Change your perspective. Change your priorities. He says the three priorities that every disciple should have at the top of their list are these that we'll discuss today. First of all, we have to have a focused mind. Secondly, we need a thirst for understanding. And thirdly, we need to seek to be continually growing in character. And as those things happen, Jesus promises all of those other things will be added to you if you hold these first three things foremost in your priorities. John Townsend says this, some of the things that we want from God are fruits of our becoming more mature and righteous as we walk with Him. But God often only gives us things we are mature enough <coughs> to use. Until we grow, we will not have them. Think about some things in your life that you've been praying for for a long time. God changed this. God made this go away. God Bring this into my life. And the word for us this morning from God is that sometimes he's waiting on us to grow into those blessings so that he can provide them. Uh, and until we take that growth step, we can't receive those things that we pray for. So we begin with the first priority, which is a focused mind. Jesus says, uh, this is what you need to do with your thoughts. He says, don't worry about all of these things. What things is he talking about? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? These are all important things. These are all things we need to live, to survive, to thrive. And yet Jesus paradoxically says, don't worry about these things. Say, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? When we think about worry, uh, it's interesting to me anyway to note how worry impacts the brain. Uh, one of the things that I teach my 
uh, early psychology students is that our brain is divided into two hemispheres or two halves and they each have a separate function. And so you can see the right brain there uh, in the diagram is very colorful and it's that way because the right brain is all about creativity and passion and uh, possibilities and emotions. And so uh, it's just a, it's a very powerful side of our brain uh, that has a flaw in it and that is that it cannot really solve problems. They can't do anything with those problems. And so instead what happens is uh, worries come along. We get a bill in the mail. Somebody tells us something we don't like. We get bad news. We hear from the government that there's another strain of COVID that's running rampant right now. And so that hits our brain and our right brain begins to go, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Bad things are going to happen. It's a disaster. My life is over. And it becomes this scenario where it just goes round and round and round in our right brain like clothes in a dryer because our right brain can't do anything with it. So thankfully God has also given us our left brain. And our left brain is analytic. It is reason. It is logic. It is problem solving. It's organization. And so it's designed to take all that stuff from the right brain, line it up, say this is what we're going to do, and then we get rid of it. It moves on out of our brain so that we can let go of it. Well, how do we make that happen? Uh, it's interesting because God has created us such that the only way we can shift those worries from our right brain to our left brain is to put it in a format that the left brain can do something with, and the left brain speaks language. It speaks words. And so that's why talk therapy works so well, is because people come in and they sit down and they speak all of the stuff they're struggling with, all of the stuff they're dealing with all of the stuff that's swirling around in their right brain. And as they speak it, it goes into the left brain, and it's able to be moved out with the help of a therapist. Prayer is the same thing. Jesus is encouraging us to pray because as we speak our worries to God, as we speak our praise to God, as we speak truth about God and about our situation, we shift those worries from the right brain to the left brain, and we're able to let go of it. Samuel Anon puts it this way. He says, to use the mind God has given us we should use both sides of our brain, not just the right brain, which helps us worry. Then our prayers become a deeply felt communion with God. Wait, there, screen cut up. Okay, so Jesus says, don't worry. What does he mean when he says, don't worry? I, one of the things that people seem to feel the most guilty about when they come to counseling is they say, I'm worrying, and I know that that means I'm sinning, and that makes me feel bad, and that makes me worry more becomes this vicious cycle. Uh, so what does Jesus mean? The word in the Greek that he uses, mer now, means to be divided into two parts. Think about the left brain versus right brain. We're just using one half of our brain. It means to go to pieces. It means to be distracted. In other words, it means that we allow everything to build up in that one half of our brain to the point where it incapacitates us. It keeps us from doing what we need to do. Uh, we see a perfect example of this, a character study in Luke chapter 10. We have the sisters, Mary and Martha. And you remember the story that Jesus uh, comes to visit in the home. And immediately Mary's like, oh my goodness, it's Jesus. And she goes and she sits down at his feet and she's enraptured and she's listening to his teaching and she's soaking it up. And Martha's running around going, oh my goodness, the house is a mess and we don't have anything to eat and I have to get all this stuff gathered up. And so she goes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, Make Mary come in and help me. Mary's being irresponsible. Control Mary. Control the situation. And Jesus' response is this. My dear Martha, you are Mary now. You are falling to pieces. You're distracted. You're divided into two parts. And you're upset over all of these details. But there is only one thing worth being concerned about. And it's not impressing other people. It's not keeping up appearances. It's not being perfect. But it is having a relationship with me. She's buying into line number one that we look at this morning, which is the primary work of righteousness is my actions. Are actions important? Absolutely, because they're a reflection of what's going on within us internally most of the time. But when we focus too much on our actions, we get overwrought, we get worried. God's work with, uh, within us is hindered when we try to concentrate on two competing priorities at once. Jesus says you can't love God and love money. You can't love the world and love me. You have to love one or the other. Our first key point uh, is that both trust and worry are functions of the thoughts that we allow to take up residence in our minds. 
trust and worry cannot coexist. Uh, Paul offers a solution to this in the letter to the church of Philippi, Philippians 4. He says, don't worry about anything. So what do we do? He says, instead, pray about everything. Make that right brain to left brain shift. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. And as you do that, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will not just be there, but it will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The great uh, missionary and minister, uh, runner of uh, an orphanage, uh, George Muller, puts it this way. He says, faith ends where worry begins. Worry ends where faith begins. And that brings us to truth number one this morning, which is that righteous living is not all about our actions, but it begins in my moment-to-moment thought line. What's going on in your mind? What thoughts are you allowed to take up residence there and control your existence? Number two, we need to have a thirst for understanding. So Jesus says, don't worry about these things. What we'll eat, what we'll drink, what we'll wear. So what do we do instead? We put our energies, we invest our energies in seeking the kingdom of God above all else. Some of you, uh, the last time I did this series, uh, approached me and said that you had watched this series on Discovery Channel. I don't know if it's still on or not, because uh, I'm not really a TV watcher much anymore, but uh, The Curse of Oak Island was this series they did on the Discovery Channel for a number of years, and it was uh, following this saga of these two brothers by the name of Rick and Marty Legina, and uh, they were two guys that had earned a lot of money in other areas of life, and they've been fascinated since they were boys with the story of uh, this place up on the northeastern coast of, I believe, Nova Scotia uh, called Oak Island. And the, the legend was that Oak Island was a place where pirates would come in and they would hide their treasure. And it's a very small island, uh, but uh, somehow there's this, supposed to be this really intricate, uh, deep hole in the island where all of this treasure is stored. And so uh, the show uh, follows this saga as they go out there and there's a very small window where it's not freezing cold and covered in snow where you can go out there and search and you have to get all the equipment and everything out there. And so over the course of, I believe, more than 10 years, uh, they had this excavation project going on out there where they were trying to find this treasure. And, of course, because Discovery Channel wants you to keep watching, they keep teasing it. They keep saying, oh, my gosh, I think they might have found something. Join us next time and we'll see what they really found. And uh, it just goes like that from episode to episode to episode. And for me, I get tired of it. I, at some point, I'm just like, okay, I don't think they're going to find anything. I don't care anymore. Uh, but this, this series stretched out for years and years. And the last I knew, uh, Rick and Marty had spent close to a million dollars out there uh, in resources and time and equipment looking for this treasure. I was reading an article about this the other day, and the author said this. What carries the day is that Rick, the older brother, is a true believer in this legend. In his heart, he believes something of historical importance really happened in this place. And because that's what he believes in his heart, it's reflected in where he allocates his finances and where he allocates his time and where he allocates his thoughts. This is the idea of seeking. The word here that Jesus uses in the Greek, sateo, means to deliberately strive after something as an act of the will. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to feel like it all the time, but you return your thoughts to this thing. You keep coming back to it. And it ends up costing you something in the long run. Uh, Skip Moen, uh, commenting on this word, says that zeteo, seeking, is a very strong word in the Greek. It isn't just looking around or checking it out. When your life is consumed with looking for God, God will find you. And then you will be completely cared for. Ask yourself, honestly, how much time do I really spend seeking God and how much of my life is just been saying, well, if God wants to talk to me, he will let me know. And uh, we miss out uh, in the meantime. Jesus talks about this concept in John chapter 4, verse 23. He says, the time is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is Zeteo. The Father is deliberately striving after something through an act of his will. He is looking for those who will worship him that way. And so the hope for us is that this is a two-way street. It's not just us going, God, where are you? But it's God going, hey, is there anybody out there who cares? Is there anybody out there who wants to know me, who wants to understand me, who wants to fellowship 
with me. And that brings us to line number two, which is that righteousness is a passive pursuit. Righteousness uh, has to do with the condition of our heart, but it's not passive in nature. It is intentional. We have to bring our minds back to it. You see, God's kingdom work is magnified when we play an active role in not only discovering, but in joining in what he is doing around us. That brings us to our second key point, which is the journey to God is almost always a series of seemingly insignificant steps. People uh, look back over their life, and many times they realize, and I have found this too, is that something happened, and it wasn't that big, big a deal at the time. It wasn't a voice coming down from the heavens. It wasn't a lightning bolt, but it was God opening a door, and I either stepped through it, and things changed, or I didn't step through it, and things stayed the same. But with each obedient step, God lights a little more of the pathway ahead. You see, uh, in the words of C.S. Lewis, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Truth number two is that righteousness is the active pursuit of God's presence in me and around me. We will not find righteousness. We will not find God unless we actively pursue it. The third thing uh, is a sense of continually growing Character. So, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, and then live righteously. When you live righteously, God will give you everything you need. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Schindler's List, or heard of Schindler's List? Okay. A few of you. Uh, it was an Oscar award-winning movie about 20 years ago. It was a story of a Czech businessman by the name of Oscar Schindler, uh, who during World War II was very opportunistic. He saw what was happening around him to the Jews and to uh, the Poles and to uh, many other people groups and recognized very quickly that this was an opportunity to make money. And so he joined the Nazi party and became a supporter of their work and their ideas and made a lot of influential business partners within the party and bought up factories. And he became extremely wealthy in the early part of World War II. And then uh, by chance, or because that's the way God orchestrated it, uh, he began to uh, employ as some cheap labor some of the Jews from the concentration camps in the area where his main factory was. And as he did so, he began to get to know those Jewish prisoners as people, and he was horrified by what was happening to him. The, uh, the atrocities began to take on a face and a name, and he found himself in a crisis of conscience. And so, uh, he began to take the wealth that he had accumulated and use it to bribe the Nazi officials to send more and more of the Jews to him to work for him. Because what he realized was, if they're not in the camp during the day, there's a better chance that they'll survive. And when they're here, I can feed them. I can take care of them. I can give them a warm place to stay. And so over the course of the latter part of World War II, Schindler spent uh, his entire fortune trying to rescue these Jews from the concentration camps. And when he, at the end of the war, uh, Schindler was a broken man, both financially and emotionally. He was declared by the nation of Israel uh, later on in his life as Yad Vashem, which means a righteous Gentile. And if you go uh, to Israel, there is a garden where they have planted trees in honor of this very small number of people that they've identified as what they call righteous Gentiles, people who acted uh, in the interest of protecting God's people during the atrocities of World War II. Uh, when asked why he did what he did, why he made that sacrifice, Schindler says this, I did what I could do, I did what I had to do, what my conscience told me I must do. It was a price that had to be paid, but he realized it was what he had to do. Uh, the, uh, the plaque that's there uh, for the righteous Gentiles uh, says partially this. Uh, the title of righteous is reserved for those who actively risk their lives or their liberty for the express purpose of saving Jews from persecution <laughs> and murder. In the absence of risk, one does not qualify for recognition. Jesus is not saying this is not a big deal to trust me, to seek first the kingdom of God. But as you do that, as you step out in faith, as you say, I'm not going to worry about these things, I'm going to choose to follow God, you become righteous, and then life changes in that process. 
The word here uh, in the Greek that Jesus uses uh, right, for righteous is takaiosune. It means to receive judicial approval. It's the word picture of being in court and the judge hears the evidence and weighs it out and says, yes, you are not guilty. It's what God would examine and deem to be good or worthy. This brings us to lie number three that many of us live by, which is, you know what? I can be inwardly righteous. I can be a good person inside, but outwardly I can do whatever I want. I can do anything I want to six days out of the week, and then Sunday morning I'll go to church, and everything will be good, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Daniel Hill puts it this way. Right living will lead us to the pursuit of justice. Justice demands right living. They are both reflective of the character of God. You cannot have one without the other. Jesus talks about this uh, later in the book of Matthew when he's doing the Sermon on the Mount and he's doing the Beatitudes and he says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for food and water, not for um, money, not for houses, not for cars, not for fancy clothes, but who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for God's approval, for they will be filled. You see, true righteousness is always going to be a choice between the easy way and the hard way. The world places the easy way in front of us as take this way, you'll be satisfied, and it never delivers. But when we take the hard way, we find that God rewards that. And as such, God continually challenges us to live a holier life. Our last key point is that our journey to righteousness is the outworking of what is changing and developing inwardly. It doesn't happen overnight. I wish it did. I wish when you come down front and you say yes to Jesus, or when you're baptized, that bang, this switch is flipped here on earth and we become completely different people. But the switch that is flipped is our destination, our relationship with God in an eternal sense. But everything else plays out. It happens based on our choices during our entire lifetime remaining here on earth. Thomas Paine uh, makes this delineation. He says, reputation is what men and women think of us. Character is what God and the angels know of us. That brings us to truth number three, which is who I am inwardly must be reflected in who I am outwardly. The two have to line up in order for us to continue to grow in Christ. In conclusion, three questions to ask yourself this week. Number one, am I willing to be the, in the kind of relationship with God that releases my mind from worry? Am I willing to catch those worries as they crop up, to speak them to God, to hand them over to Him, and to let them go? Number two, am I taking the daily steps that are necessary for knowing God deeply? Am I seeking the kingdom of God first? Am I making my mind conform to what God wants it to. And then thirdly, am I committed to making my outward behavior match my inward convictions? Even if it costs me something, even if it's inconvenient, even if it hurts in the short term, am I willing to do that? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that the problems that we face today are not new. They're not a surprise to you. They are things that have troubled humankind from the beginning. And so we thank you for the hope that we find that Jesus came and lived and he died on the cross and he rose again so that we can be delivered from these struggles and so that we can enjoy eternal life with you. Pray that you give us wisdom and strength to live lives that are pleasing and that will be encouraging to others. And we ask this in Jesus' name.